Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to all those who are present here uh, in the Armstrong Atrium and to all those who are viewing this through our live stream channel. Uh, to this, our fifth Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture of this academic year. Uh, my name is Arvind Raman, I'm the Executive Associate Dean here in the College of Engineering. Uh, now, this series began in 2018 uh, really as a way to bring some of the world renowned thought leaders uh, in their respective disciplines to Purdue Engineering to engage in meaningful conversations and thought-provoking discussions with their students and faculty on the grand challenges of the time in the discipline uh, and also the opportunities. And our speakers, when they come here, they visit for about one and a half days, they engage in both a lecture, which is what we're going to have right now, as well as in a panel that's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, so please uh, make note uh, of the panel event tomorrow as well, if you can attend it. And uh, in the process of doing so, uh, you know, they are able to really uh, bring our entire community here in Purdue Engineering who's, in, who's interested and engaged in that particular area uh, across disciplines to really uh, have meaningful uh, conversations on the topic. Today's lecture uh, by Professor Anna Barros is co-hosted by the Lyle School of Civil Engineering. So I'd like to call upon Rao S. Govindaraju, the Bowen head of the Lyle School of Civil Engineering to introduce our speaker today. All right, uh, thank you, Arvin. And again, good morning to, to all of you. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Anna Barros. She's the Donald Beggar Willett Chair of Engineering and Department Head of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois, the Granger College of Engineering. Uh, her primary research interests are in hydrology, which also happens to be my area. She also does hydrometeorology, meteorology, environmental physics, is interested in water cycle processes in regions of complex terrain, remote sensing of the environment, predictability and risk assessment of extreme events. So all very, very relevant topics. She has served on multiple national committees over the years, including Space Studies Board of the National Research Council, Water Science and Technology Board, Board of Atmospheric Sciences and Climate, and the US National Committee for the International Hydrology Program of UNESCO. Uh, she was a senior fellow at the Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas and a founding member of the ASC Committee on Climate Change and Adaptation. Uh, Dr. Barros is a past chair of Atmospheric and Hydrospheric Sciences at AAAS and president-elect of the hydrology section of AGU. She was the chief editor of the Journal of Hydrometeorology for five years, member of the editorial board of AGU Advances, uh, she's a fellow of AGU, AMS, ASC, and AAAS, senior member of IEEE, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. I know. Well, good morning, everyone. I can see that my first slide is here. Thank you so much for the very kind uh, but very kind introduction. So it's a real pleasure to be here today, especially because we um, emphasize uh, so much interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity, and that's really what my career has been about, working at the, at the interface of disciplines. So I work a lot in, in mountainous regions, mountains, some tall, some small, and, uh, and uh, I also do a lot of remote sensing work. And so the focus of the talk is going to be on, on processes, on precipitation processes in mountainous uh, regions, and what we have learned through observations from space, observations on the ground, and modeling to help us understand um, really freshwater resources, right? Which is what, uh, what precipitation is all about. So before I start, just as an introduction, I wanted to show the classic textbook a definition of orographic precipitation. So what happens is when you have an, uh, an obstacle like a mountain and you have moist air that comes uh, against uh, the mountain, the air is lifted, is forced up, and as it goes up, it gets to cooler temperatures and eventually condensation starts. Of course, in most of these, of these drawings, in books, in textbooks, and you know, this one is, is from the 
uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. You don't talk about aerosols, for example, but actually you cannot form stable clouds without, of course, having aerosols. And then on the other side of the, of the mountain, as the air comes down on the other side, it, of course, it warms up, it expands. And so usually, or, you know, not so usually actually, but in the textbook representation, there is a rain shadow on the lee side of, uh, of, of the mountain because all the moisture, you know, if it uh, um, evaporates again, if, uh, if it was still there, if it had not been removed. So that's basically the textbook definition of uh, orographic precipitation. Then next, I wanted to introduce to you the, the basis for the colors of water, right? And actually, if, if we talked with some faculty earlier, and we think always about gray water, right, or brown water, and so on, from the point of view of, of water quality. But the colors of water that I want to talk about are related to policy. And so in 1985, Malin Falkenmark, who, um, was working at, uh, at, the, um, at the UN, really came up with this framework. There was a paper published in 1985, which actually has very, very few citations, despite having had huge impact. And in this paper, she formulated the problem of water resources as having, as, as having two components. One component being blue water, which is the water that flows in rivers, that's available from aquifers. And the other one would be green water, which is the water that is needed and must be available for vegetation. And that was the idea of the, consum of the consumptive um, water use by vegetation. And so one of, one of the citations that I like to use from, from her work is, is this, that a land use decision is a water use decision. I think if we move forward now and we think about all the work that we have done in the last 20 years and some of that done by faculty here at, uh, at Purdue, focusing on land atmosphere interactions, we actually know now that vegetation plays a very important role in the formation of precipitation itself. And so I think about that as adding the, the I guess, the, the white water or the, or the clear water to this, um, to, to this cycle. And so that citation actually needs to be changed or improved, right, in some way. And that is really, it's not about just use, is that actually land use and land cover have a huge impact on water resources as they are. And it's really a more general, a more general uh, uh, principle that should govern us. And this is especially important in civil engineering and when we look at at regional planning and so on, because of the big decisions that we make in terms of infrastructure systems and water systems uh, and so on. So going back to talk about mountains, and so another, another aspect of, of the presence of mountains that I wanted to emphasize is how they set these huge continental scale boundaries along uh, uh, between wet and dry, so between the uh, the wet side and uh, the rain shadow side, and you can see that there along the, uh, the western US and, for example, in the Himalayas. And then another type of boundary that's also very important in tall mountains is where the tree line is. So we have limitations in how much moisture you have at higher elevations, right, and how much condensation you can actually uh, can make happen uh, at at higher elevations. And so as ab above 4,000 meters or so, we start having much, much lower vegetation because of temperature, but also because of decreases in moisture availability. And so the tree line is another important boundary that is as associated with big, with big mountain ranges that we, we must consider. So looking at, uh, at, uh, at this issue of spatial organization and, and the important role of, of satellites and, and observations from space in helping us look at Earth as a whole, right, as the entire planet. So we can look at very large scale uh, features. This is a picture of the cloud cover from the International Space uh, Station over the Andes. And you can see on the, on the I, I'm not sure if I can point here, but on the, on the side of the Amazon, you see all the clouds you know, basically protruding out and then on the Pacific side, you see the very dry rain shadow 
actually on the ocean side. And that's also because uh, uh, that is a very cold current in the ocean along the coast of Peru, which basically contributes to this, um, to this dryness. But so if we look at mountains around the world, what you'll see is that even though weather is very hard to predict and clouds seem to be very hard to predict, when we do something like a principal component analysis, for example, of cloud fields over one or two decades, what we find is that the first principal component actually explains 70% of the variability of clouds over the Himalayas, over the Andes, over the Western over the Western Rockies, and that's just because the topography is actually controlling that condensation. Now, clearly, what happens along this, along with cloudiness, is that precipitation is also associated with this. And so you can see in, this, in these two figures here, what I, am, what I am showing are precipitation features identified from the TRIM satellite at night and day over, over the central Andes. And what I want to point out, if I can, I don't know how to point with this, actually, I should have asked, but um, I'd like you to look at that area of white by the, uh, by the bottom right of that, uh, of that plot. And so this is interesting, right? Because we're looking at 15 years of data and you can see that there are areas there where it, it was never detected. Precipitation was never detected over 15 years every time uh, the satellite passed. And that's actually where the tree line is. So you can clearly see these features from the large-scale observations from satellites. Thank you so much. I think that this will, will help me. Yes, maybe. And so, and so on, uh, during daytime, because of solar of solar forcing, we have a little bit more evidence of, of, a very light, of very light rainfall. Other, but because of, this, uh, of the spatial distribution of these precipitation features, we can now go from these observations and actually start looking at what the landscape looks like, right? And look at, at continental scale uh, landform evolution patterns. And so, what you see here in the first, uh, in the first um, uh, plot is a distribution of those precipitation features I showed you before uh, in, this, uh, in, that, uh, in that little yellow box uh, in the Andes. And you see two peaks, right? We see a very large peak at low elevations, and that's the, uh, the convection in the Amazon. And you see another peak at, uh, at higher elevations, which is just before we hit the tree line. Right, so we have another another increase in the in the number of features. But what's really fascinating from this is that when you look at this landscape, this is actually what it looks like, and you can see from looking at those rivers the size of the boulders in the rivers. Right, so this precipitation can move; it effectively moves mountains, and and we know that the Amazon for a basin is formed because of these materials that are coming from the. Uh, from the Andes. And so the synergy between the high elevations, what happens in the, in the mid elevations, which are basically a transport region, and then goes and, uh, and supports uh, the Amazon basin. So when we look now at this from the point of view of a river basin, we can actually look at the distribution of, uh, of, uh, of these precipitation features according to the other river networks. And what you'll see is that we, we can actually match each one of these, of, of these peaks and features in, in this distribution to features in the landscape, in the mountain itself. And so it's this association between the spatial distribution of precipitation, landform, right, at all scales, and that can be explained by a dynamic processes. Hydrology in this case is, is, is really important. So I'll show a lot of the Andes uh, here today. <laughs> and so we have actually um, an observing uh, network that goes from the low elevations in the Amazon basin up to above uh, 4,000 meters in the, in the, in, in the Cosnipata uh, Valley in, um, in, in Peru. And we have these uh, towers that are above canopy level so we can uh, measure the precipitation without being affected by the vegetation. You see here on the side, this is a picture of the ridge where our, where our rain gauges uh, uh, are. 
And so what I'm showing here is a comparison between what's observed, which is in blue from satellites, and, and those are different satellite products, and what's observed at the gauges. And the point of showing you this distribution, I have two points here. One is to focus on very light rainfall, which is essential for the water cycle. For many years, we, when we use rain gauges, we miss a significant fraction of the light rainfall. And so, and, and as you can see, this is something that also we have a difficulty in seeing from we, using ground-based radars, and this is true also from space. So we're missing a lot of the rainfall that actually explains the resilience of these, of these ecosystems. And then when we look at, uh, at uh, the, um, the extreme rainfall, what you'll see, okay, so the order that was a little bit uh, uh, different, you'll see that up to 1,500 meters, we have actually observed as much rain as you would get from a hurricane like Katrina in a New Orleans in about six hours. So you can get rainfall intensities in these mountains that are on the, on the order of magnitude of a, hurricane, of a hurricane impact. And those are also not, not uh, um, um, well predicted by, of course, or, or observed by satellites, or, 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 or in fact by most, uh, by most of, the, of the ground observing systems. So we were really interested in this very extreme event, right? Because we looked at all other types of evidence we could find, and we could not really explain this. How does this happen? And so after looking at this, what we discovered was that all of these extreme events over over the history of the, of the precipitation records that we could find in this region, we're associated with these cold air intrusions, which are basically cold fronts that come from South America all the way up into, into the Amazon. And these, and these, uh, and these events at the, at, the, at the point where the air basically from south and the air from north along the Andes meet, that's where these extreme events form. So they're extremely localized, and you can get these very, very heavy uh, precipitation events, and you can see that from looking, for example, these are model simulations that show that the, high, uh, the highest vertical wind velocities, which are needed to form those really deep clouds that will produce that very heavy rainfall, happen exactly at the intersection of the two air masses. And so they happen in very, very specific places. Okay, so in this case, we started with ground observations. We said, look at all this rainfall. How could this possibly happen? So then we did modeling to examine what was actually going on. And so we identified processes. After having done this, we went back and looked at climatology from satellite again. And, and in this case, from the TRIM satellite mission. And what we found is that when we look at those precipitation features that I was showing you before, that seem just randomly distributed in that landscape, actually they're very different when they are associated with these cold air intrusions. And in fact, we looked at the diurnal cycle of extreme rainfall everywhere along the Andes, and we found that this was associated with cold air intrusions as well. And so, this is, you know, this is fascinating that we can do this because we're looking at what happens at lower elevations. We're looking at extreme events. But I want to emphasize that before we did this study, when we thought about cold air intrusions, most of the papers were all about the effect it had on crops and because of the frost and how, uh, uh, you know, farmers would lose all their, all their harvest because of these, of these cold air intrusions. And the link between cold air intrusions and extreme rainfall was actually had never been made before. And we could only do this because we were there to observe it on, on the ground, right? If we hadn't seen it, we would not have believed it, <laughs> pretty much. And then we had the model to help us build a hypothesis, and we had the satellite data to, to help us go back and really provide the historical uh, context for, uh, for what we were seeing here. And so this is an example of the kind of research that we, can, that we could do over the last 20 years that was not possible previously. Now, focusing on this region, this is really um, interesting, is to look at 
the distribution of, of, of land cover along the Andes and, um, and, uh, and specifically focusing on vegetation. This is actually you know, a, historical, uh, um, a historical drawing there from the Andes, from Humboldt's trips in, in South America, right? And it's amazing, nothing is at to scale, but, but the science is, is really there and, and, uh, and, quite, um, and quite accurate. And so I want to focus now on that picture that I showed you in the beginning where the tree line shows very clearly. And, uh, and I want to go back and, and look at the, at the role of vegetation actually in, in, in helping, not during the extreme events, but all the other precipitation that happens in this region of the world is actually aided by vegetation. And without the forests in the Amazon, we could not, we could not you know, possibly have uh, the vegetation that we are um, observing. So there's a very, a, a very close link between the cloud line and, uh, and uh, the tree line in this region. And so these are all very pretty pictures that I wanted to show you just because I had very pretty pictures and that's why I love the mountains and we love being up there. Um, but this is a depiction of our, of our, of our towers on this envelope uh, monitoring network along the elevation and mapping also the, uh, the vegetation that goes with it. And so you can see that at the lower elevations, we have basically tropical forest, right? And as we go up with elevation, we're getting into, into the cloud forest uh, at higher elevations. So now I wanted to show you a little bit of, of history of what things looked like many, many years ago in terms of the, of the tree distribution in this region of the world. And this is from Palio Records and using our colleagues in, in, uh, in, um, in, um, in other departments looking at, at, at this kind of analysis. So what you see there uh, on the right is the, the, uh, the distribution of trees in the pre-Inca era. And what you see on the left is what it looks like, the same region, but after, after, the, after the Incas and after the, the, you know, the, the colonization and so on. And so the first thing to go, right, as, as agriculture expanded, were, at, were the trees at, uh, at high elevations. And so now what is going on, though, is with all the deforestation happening at low elevations against the, uh, the hill slopes of the Andes, what we have is the pressure in terms of the vegetation is actually happening from the bottom up. So we have this region of the world is actually under stress, historical stress in terms of decreasing of the vegetation cover of the forests from high down uh, earlier on and now presently going up from the Amazon uh, up, uh, up, up the slopes. And so what does that mean, right, in terms of, of implications for water resources in this, uh, in this region of the world? So that's what we wanted to actually check. And, and, and there has been, you know, uh, many of you have probably heard about the RED program, where there's incentives uh, to, uh, to, to local uh, communities, excuse me, to preserve their forests and ecosystems and so on. And there's a lot of work and, and huge investment made into, into that work. And so along with, the, with a number of colleagues, that's a very, you know, that paper that is cited there has lots of authors because it was really a lot of work. We did an inventory of the changes in vegetation since, since these measures were put in place. And in fact, what you see is that at higher elevations, there has been conservation of the forest. But in the lower elevations, that's not happening. And that's what is, you know, basically along the, uh, the, um, the foothills of, of the Andes against um, the Amazon. So for us then, the, the, um, uh, the scientific question, and I'm sorry about, about how this was working out, was to ask if, if this keeps going, right, what is the implication of deforestation along the foothills of the Andes on precipitation in, uh, in the Andes themselves? And so what we did was a bunch of studies looking at sensitivity analysis between the control, which is having forest, and, and the, the, another scenario, which is a, de a deforestation scenario. 
And so what you see is that for all kinds of relevant uh, weather systems, weather types, and so on, the, uh, the vegetation plays a very, very important role in producing medium, you know, moderate rainfall rates. So we have a strong decrease in rainfall at, for all cases in the elevations that are orographically active in terms of precipitation. So we're talking about the region between the, uh, the low elevations in the, in the Amazon and say about 3,000 meters, but you know, the peak of the activity in terms of precipitation is at about 1,500 meters. And so what you see there is, is this very strong decrease in the moderate rainfall rates and low rainfall rates. And so this, this is linking deforestation in the Amazon, right, to drought and, and, uh, and decreased freshwater resources at high elevations in the Andes. So we, we tested um, this also through, through more general modeling. And, and so what you see is the squeezing of, of that uh, autographic freshwater harvesting zone. And what I wanted to show here is that as a result of, of, uh, of deforestation, the precipitation generally goes downslope and becomes lighter rainfall. So you saw the negative sign there was actually an increase in light rainfall. Now imagine, and I'll show you later, what are the plans for dam building along the Andes, right? There's a whole ream basically the equivalent of the Great Wall of China, but along the, along the, the, uh, the high ele um, uh, elevations of the Andes. But if there's no rain at high elevations, those dams are going to be basically doing nothing, right? Because you can't collect water and you can't produce electricity from this. And so it's this connection between deforestation in the, in the, in along the foothills and precipitation at high elevations, that's not immediately clear, right? It's, it's something that we, we can only talk about because we've, we've done these studies looking at, 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 these, at these problems from, uh, from different perspectives. And of course, if it's not raining at the high elevations either, we don't have erosion. And so the material fluxes into the Amazon basin will be severely decreased. Right? And that's what maintains the Amazon functioning because, of course, you know, the rivers in the Amazon are carrying sediments to, to the ocean all the time. Right? And so you need the disbalance of, of, of materials coming in and, and going out. So it's, it's really not something very simple. You know, it, when we talk about uh, deforestation in the Amazon, it's not just about carbon capture and, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. It's, it's about much more than, uh, than that, especially in terms of the, of the water cycle. So one thing one of my students did were, were these studies where instead of cutting the forest, we actually focused on the, on the flux by which forests really mostly impact uh, uh, precipitation and the atmosphere, which is through evapotranspiration. So he did some studies where we extracted all the evapotranspiration produced by trees along specific uh, specific bands or elevation lines. You know, basically every time step in the model, which was like every ten seconds or so. So this was a major a major labor uh, of love. But this was really important because as a result of this, we could actually associate evapotranspiration with moist instability in the atmosphere, and that means convective activity and convective storms, right? And uh, in along the entire uh, Andes, um, Andes, uh, Eastern Andes range. And also very importantly associated with this is that you, you can relate this moist ins instability to uh, uh, basically um, uh, the moisture convergence along the, the orographically active uh, region of, uh, of the Andes. And so there's a significant decrease because we have less instability in the atmosphere, the upslope pool of, the, of, of, uh, of moisture is, uh, is really decreased. And so what we can see is that you, you you probably have heard about how trees and how recycling of moisture is so important in the Amazon, which is, which is absolutely true. But in terms of mountains, the role of, 
of vegetation is not to produce mass to help with more precipitation, is to actually produce instability in the atmosphere that is necessary to pull the moisture up, uh, up slope. So that's a, a, whole, a, whole different, a whole different perspective. And so that's why we can have a cloud forest at, at 3,000 meters and 4,000 meters. The only reason why we can do that is because we can pull that moisture and form, and form those clouds. So, so effectively, these mountain uh, uh, forests are pumping low level moisture through this process of, uh, of, uh, of instability, of moist instability. And, and of course, the impact of, of just you know, cutting the forest then, because you have less convective activity, is about 50% decrease in precipitation, which is really a sobering value, right, if we think about that. And, and think this is not so crazy because these regions are actually very thin. The mountains are very steep. So getting rid of vegetation over a very significant uh, area is very easy in this, in this region. And I don't mean easy in a, in a good way, of course. Um, so we did other studies also looking at the effect of, of recycling in the mountains versus, versus the Amazon. And what's the impact of cutting just forest anywhere in the Amazon basin on the, on the Andes itself? And so in the, in the Amazon, it has impact on the recycling, right? And so it, it decreases recycling of, uh, of water and so, and, and so you have less rainfall. But in the mountains, actually, deforestation of the Amazon leads to a switch in the diurnal cycle of rainfall. And you can imagine how that is, is, would, would affect ecosystems, for example, and, and the montane forests and so on. It's not so much that in the model, of course, you know, these are model results, that the amount of rain changes, but that it, when it rains, completely changes, right? And so the type of, of, uh, of vegetation and trees that would, uh, would live in this kind of, of environment would be completely different. So I promised that I would show you the, uh, the distribution of dams planned for this region of the world, and you can understand why this matters a lot, right? Because we're talking about very, very thin regions of the world with very steep slopes where a lot is happening. That's where a lot of the activity is going on. These are truly hot spots for the water cycle. And so the implications in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, of societal you know, projects, dams, economic development, and so on in these regions are truly, are truly huge. For us in civil engineering, when we think about water resources, it forces us to think about things in a different way, right? It's thinking about continental scale. And everybody's upstream and everybody's downstream, right? And so we cannot really think about, you know, so this, I think we were very fortunate to, to do this work in this, in this age when we think about the Earth system as a whole, right? And we are all connected. And, and that really bears true in these, in these data and in, the, and in this analysis, right? It's not just some, you know, some nice concept that we, we talk about. And so I know I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to show you how land use, right, and land cover actually changes microclimates or climate in the landscape. And so, these are results from a climatology of low-level clouds done using MODIS data, so you know, a more than a decade of data over the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And the, the scale here, the color scale, is the number of days uh, in the season, in the specific season, during which, uh, uh, when, uh, when cloud cover was detected. And so you can see as you would expect, this is the area of the Great Smoky Mountains, where there's always lots of clouds, right? It's, you know, it's a beautiful area. And you can see that in the summer, we have lots of clouds over the ridges in, uh, in daytime. And that is true also in the spring, although, although in, in, lower, in lower frequency. But in the summer, basically every day, every other day, depending on where you are, you always have the, uh, uh, the ridge embedded in, in, uh, in cloud. But see those very dark blue dots everywhere. So when we first looked at this, we didn't know what it was because we were just using satellite data and we were plotting them. We had not plotted them on the top of a DEM or anything like that. And then when we started looking at them on the DEM, then we quickly discovered that they're not just associated with uh, the topography, because our hypothesis was, oh, you know, maybe this is associated with some valley ridge you know, type of process, but rather actually associated with the TVA. 
So the Tennessee Valley Authority, as you know, has developed or has built since, since the 1930s, it was the first large scale system of dams in the world and it was both an economic and, uh, and a, a social policy sort of, uh, of a project in this region. And you would not have expected that it would have impacted in this way. I'm sure at the time nobody was thinking about the impact the impact on climate that you would have by putting all of those dams. And so basically you can see that the clouds are forming all along the margins and that's where the rain is happening and so on. So we have the, the, the lake breeze is actually controlling low level clouds uh, and, and rainfall in, uh, in this region of the world. And of course this is very interesting also because in the 1920s and 1910s and so on, this region was heavily used for agriculture. There was lots of, of uh, 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 grazing, you know, cattle, uh, and so on. And so it was only after the late 1920s and 1930s that, you know, these practices were abandoned and uh, the national park was formed. And so today we have lots of vegetation in this region and beautiful trees again and so on. And the question is, what is, what is the relationship here, right? So we actually have an experiment of recovery, of landscape recovery. And, and the question of interpreting that is, is very interesting. So we've done some studies in this region. I don't have a lot of time. But what we have found is that in this region, you, you actually cannot tell the difference between high elevations and low elevations in terms of, of rainfall amount. So when we have very large scale systems, you know, basically like the, not as the purple box, but as the, the, pink, the pink ellipse, when you have a large scale storm system, you know, they come through, these mountains are not tall enough to really create a difference anywhere. And so you just have lots of rainfall everywhere. But when we have locally controlled processes, and that's basically the, the valley ridge you know, type of processes and where those low level clouds are forming, then what we find is that actually it rains more in the valleys than it rains at high elevation. So it's actually a total uh, uh, a reverse, a reverse effect. And what we found in this region that was very interesting these are data from a large field campaign that was funded by NASA in, uh, in this region, and this was part of a ground validation effort for, for the new precipitation mission, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. And um, as it happens, when you, you plan field work, you hope for rain, and we didn't have that much rain for the rain uh, field experiment that year. But what was interesting was that we measured the contribution of fog at some locations at, in those regions that are embedded by low level clouds, the contribution of, of what we call you know, fog or lateral rain into, into the system was twice as high as the actual precipitation. And so the point here being that these clouds and, and, and we have low elevation cloud forests in this region. And so the fog and these low level clouds are actually essential for, for the resilience of these ecosystems and, and for the hydrology of this region. And by the way, a lot of this rain cannot be measured by rain gauges because they just don't have the resolution to be able to get that. So when we calibrate hydrology models <laughs> to make sure that we get the rainfall from the rain gauges sort of right, we're probably missing sometimes in this region about 50% of, uh, of, the, of the water, of the fresh water input into the system. And so, and I think, I don't know how much more time I have. I have about five minutes, so that's great because I will, I will go on to show you what that looks like when you're there and looking at, uh, at, uh, at what being embedded looks like from our own pictures and network. And uh, it impacts uh, diurnal cycle and so on. So this is when we started doing some, some microphysics work and actually measuring uh, the rainfall process from, from aerosols through activation, through, through cloud formation and through rainfall and develop models that allow us to explain, right? So not only we have more rain at, at lower elevations, but I, I you know, please look at, uh, at, at this data that showed the size, the average, um, um, you know, mass weighted size of raindrops. And so what you'll see is that the green 
uh, dots are actually from a station at higher elevation at about 1500 meters, and the blue dots are actually in the valleys nearby. And so this is because of this uh, cedar feeder interaction process where we have uh, a light rainfall coming in with, with, with stratiform systems. And as this rainfall falls through this low level clouds and fogs that are embedding our landscape, basically the raindrops grow, you know, they collect smaller drops and they become much bigger. And you can see that's twice the size, right, of the raindrops. So our models, weather models and climate models cannot reproduce these results because we don't have yet the ability to solve these microphysics in the models, right? But the implications of these, of course, for what happens locally, and I'll, I will focus, for example, just simply on, um, I, will, I will go over this and focus on will not discuss this, but focus on the impact of, of, of having a, a more accurate representation of the local aerosols in, in a model. And, uh, and what you will see, I will skip this too, because this will take us much longer. And, but I wanted to show this in terms of the impact it has on the surface energy budget, right? So it's not just about that we have these larger drop sizes in the case of rainfall, but, but, but that we have these multi-layer clouds forming in this landscape. And as you can see, for example, at a certain time of day, the difference at some locations in terms of the surface uh, temperature is like being under the shade of a tree, right? In this case, we are under the shade of the clouds, and, and they can be as high as 6 degrees or 5 degrees. So this contributes to huge uh, uh, gradients, right, in, uh, in, in temperature in this, uh, in this landscape. So you can have one slope that has, for example, 20, is at 20 degrees C, and another slope nearby that is at 15 or 13 degrees. And that's just because of the cloud, of the cloud cover effect. And so this is another thing that we also must account for in, in our water resources and hydrology models, right? Because we're not really accounting for this uh, a spatial variability. And I don't want to be, it sounds like I'm being very tough on our hydrology models. And I want to say, and they work, right? We have been making decisions using those models for 50 or 70 years. And for the most part, it's still working well. And why is that? Because engineers always do everything with a little bit of a, <laughs> of a give, right? <laughs> and so we always have a safety factor. It's not exactly the same concept as, you would, as it would be in structures, in a beam or in foundations, but it's very similar, right? The idea idea is, um, is the same. Now, I just wanted to, I will, I will end here with this is an example of why. So I talked a lot about trees, about ecosystems, about these in interactions, but I wanted to show you that, in fact, this is very useful for immediate, um, having better understanding of the spatial of, you know, detailed spatial variability of rainfall in these regions, for example, is very important for landslides. This area of the mountains is actually one of the most active landslide regions in the, in, in the continental US. And if we don't get the precipitation timing right and the right amounts, we cannot predict when landslides are going to happen. But if we have that, we actually can look at the entire uh, water cycle at at the watershed scale and predict with pretty good uh, confidence based on the data that we have when a landslide will happen and when we'll have the highest uh, uh, subsurface flow uh, rates at, at specific uh, places in the, in the landscape. So, um, so this is back where we started, right? And so we talked about deforestation and land atmosphere interactions. And then we talked about, you know, uh, air quality, aerosols, and precipitation. And that central map there shows planned dams everywhere in the world. So as you can see, every mountain barrier that's not in the US because all the dams have already been built <laughs> in some ways, but everywhere else in the world, there are huge plans for building more and more dams, right? And so after you build a dam, it's there, right? It's a singularity in the landscape. And so any changes in the redistribution of water and fluxes have implications at, uh, at continental scale. And uh, I'll terminate there. Thank you.
Could you turn this on? Is it on? Any, uh, thank you, Professor Barros. Any question for Professor Barros? We have a few minutes. Is it on? Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, towards the end, you had mentioned uh, if you had like better precipitation data, it could help with um, better modeling for landslides and things like that. Uh, kind of like a general question, what other data sources do you think could help like enable you to build better models for, for the prediction you're trying to do? Uh, like what, what sort of gaps are there that you think can be improved, improved upon? So that's a really very hard question, right? Because the question you asked, I don't have an answer for that. I'll say everything. We need everything, right? And so it's really interesting when you make a decision to go from a a more applications-oriented use of models, right, to a more science-oriented use of models, one of exploration. Then we discover that all of these interactions, right, the interactions between clouds and, and the surface energy budget, and of course, land cover, which affects albedo and the emissivity of that land cover, right? And then the type of rainfall, this, the, you know, the importance of this, of, of light rainfall, right? The very sm slow, slow amount, but that actually it's keeping everything functional functioning, right? And, and so how do we, all of those data are very, very important, right? And it's um, one thing we've learned, I think, also with satellite data is that the best products are the ones where you start from the, the raw measurement or the original measurement, our nominal measurement. And then in order to come up with, with a retrieved quantity, we use as much information as possible, right? As we do that, even our retrievals get better. So, um, yeah, I don't have an answer for that, but I can tell you that as a hydrologist, I do think that clouds and rain have been underappreciated for, the, for a long, long time because we have focused on, the, on just events, right? On rainfall runoff response, big floods and so on. But there's what keeps the system going is actually a whole different set of, of processes. Okay, thanks. Uh, conversation about uh, data. In some ways, there aren't enough data, but in other ways, we have been observing climate for such a long time that uh, there are m lots of data. Uh, quality of data is another matter, but within the available data, are there scientific groups uh, looking at those data from the top? point of uh, using modern methods of machine learning and artificial intelligence to generate data that are realistic rather than uh, waiting for collecting many, many more data for this urgent problem? So in terms of, of using AI to get that retrieval, right, we have actually used some, and, and that's helpful when we have observations, right? And when we understand the processes, I think, so we, as our host, we have been using, say, for example, neural networks since, the, the, you know, the mid nineties, when it was a bad thing to do, right? Where everybody said, oh, that's a black box. That's not something that, that you should do and so on. And yet we were very successful, right? At the different scales in terms of, of, uh, of prediction, not very successful in getting funding, at least on my side, <laughs> to keep the work going. But, but what we have now is we have a lot more data, right? And we have a lot more algorithms and access to tools um, and so on. I, I think you can't do it blindly, meaning you can't just throw a bunch of data at some tools and expect that they that they will uncover, you know, miraculous things. But, but I think the informed user and the one who is always looking for a physical explanation, you know, behind what's found, then that is a good, a good use. So we've shown, for example, using very simple, we started using lots of data, all the data that we had available actually from GPM to uh, make prediction of, the, of this low level of, of whether it was raining or not, right? Because it's very difficult for satellites in mountainous regions to see below two kilometers in the atmosphere. And I just showed you that 
all the activity that matters is happening below two kilometers. So that sort of undercuts the, you know, yeah. the, whole, the whole premise. So we have shown that by using uh, data, really, and using these tools to help us find predictability, we can make huge improvements, right? Going from, for example, false alarm rates that are very high to very low, missed uh, detection uh, in increasing up to, to 90%, right? And, and that's because of this combination of the physics-guided or physics-based uh, uh, development of AI. So I'm, I, I think it would be great to have people in computer science, for example, and, and physical scientists work together in these problems. Yes, Dr. Barros, thank you for your uh, presentation. Very interesting. I'm Professor Jacko in Environmental here in Civil. Uh, you indicated that uh, the ground truth data that you were taking was very important. As a matter of fact, the light rainfall was extremely important, but you were missing a lot of it. Are you suggesting to the instrumentation designers that we need some better light rainfall gauges to capture a lot of the data that you say we are missing? So thank you for that question, because if it was a different type of talk, I would have gone into those details, so I appreciate it very much. So we actually started measuring this very light rainfall by using these drometers. And uh, these drometers are sensors that, uh, with some uncertainty, allow us to detect individual raindrops or or, or, or cloud drops even, right? We have an instrument that allows us to go into, into, the, into the micron, you know, like a, a 15, 20 micron level of, uh, of drop size. And so by doing that, what we found was that we had these drometers alongside rain gauges and, and vertically pointing radars. And we could see the signal in the radar the rain gauge could not see anything, but the signal in the radar was, was, um, was um, actually very strong following the, the, you know, the cedar feeder uh, effects in increasing the raindrop size. We could perfectly detect them in the, in the radar at low levels. But the rain gauge would take half an hour to start detecting rain because it takes time for those drops to grow. And yet our disdrometers were already measuring drops much, uh, you know, for half an hour or more. And in many days when we would only have the, that fog or, or those very low level clouds, we can detect the drops, we can characterize the size distribution and the rain gauges, it's like nothing happened. Right? So those instruments are there and, and they're getting better. You know, in the beginning, some of them had biases and so on because uh, they are uh, difficult to, um, uh, to build, but, but they are there. And, and the message is that, yes, after you start using those instruments, you start noticing how much rainfall you were missing before. Any other questions for Dom? Uh, Professor Barros, I'm not in the area, but, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about uh, attribution science. Um, you know, so modeling, of course, helps potentially predict what changes you might expect in the ecosystem you're modeling. But looking backwards and making observations and saying that this observation uh, could not have happened without said human activity, etc., you know, going backwards. How is that playing into the kind of calculations you do and, you know, because I, I understand those are being done at very large, large scale simulations, you know, to look at, um, you, you know, control case and versus non-control case. How's that playing out in your area? So this is, you know, this is a very good question. For example, those experiments where we looked at the effect of deforestation along the foothills alone, you know, those were very realistic. So we used our analysis from that paper in, uh, um, in global biology to, to actually map the region where the forest is being, is being uh, eliminated, right? And, uh, and, and, uh, and so we had that information. If we don't have that sort of detailed information, it's very difficult to, to make the analysis. Now, I should say that there's no regional or global climate model that can resolve these kinds of a very thin but critical features of the landscape, 
right? Because we don't have the resolution to do that. And so we need to, to be at, at below one kilometer resolution <laughs> to do this, actually, right? And so that is really the big challenge, right? Um, but I think we can, because again, I want to emphasize that I feel very privileged to have started my research career at the same time as the Earth Observing System a program at NASA was, was being developed. And so my generation, I and my colleagues, all benefited, you know, from huge from having these huge data sets, right? And so we can do climatology at very large scales now. We can do actually climate studies using satellite data, which was unthinkable uh, 25 or 30 years ago. And so that has allowed us to do attribution in a much more, uh, how to say, cause and effect you know, sort of, of way, because you can go and look in detail and look at what's happening in that landscape and what's changing. Not that we're discovering anything. I remember being an undergraduate student and working on environmental impact statements, which was a big thing, right? Actually, the US was the, the, the world leader in creating this, this concept of the environmental impact uh, statement for civil engineering projects, right? And, um, and yet we haven't really changed much in the law or anything like that in, the, in, the, in, in these 50 years. But I remember that having a professor saying, well, this dam is going to be built somewhere and there's going to be huge implications for agriculture because nobody's expecting that you're going to have so much more fog that these types of crops will not survive. And, you know, he was a very smart man who could make these associations. But it's not the most obvious thing for most of us, right? What we can do now, because we have the satellite data, is to actually demonstrate, yes, that these changes are happening. And, 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 and so, and see what kinds of implications they have. I don't know that the models are yet there, but, to, but we have, we're very fortunate to have 30 years of, of satellite data that allow us to, to go back and check some of our hypotheses and, and premises. And NASA does not pay me to say these things. <laughs> <laughs> but the perfect building to have the seminar. Like, like, like. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Barros? Yes, no. One second. Uh, excellent talk, Dr. Barr, was very inspiring. Um, I have a question. You have done your field work in many different areas of the world, regions of the world. Uh, what kinds of relationships have you found between the type of forest and the type of vegetation and the type of uh, fog, cloud cover, uh, you know, uh, precipitation? So, so what you see is, is actually very similar in the Himalayas. We had a field a field site in the Himalayas for five and a half years. And, uh, and so, and that's why actually I went to the Andes because we couldn't keep that field site going. So we, <laughs> we moved to another big mountain somewhere. And, and we're finding, of course, the way moisture comes in, right, is, is very different in the Indian subcontinent versus how it comes in in the, in the Andes. Um, but, uh, but in terms of the distribution of, of vegetation with elevation, the issues of changes in temperature and, and changes in moisture availability, they are very, uh, very similar. Um, but um, yes, the, the monsoon season in South America is not the monsoon season in, in northern India, for example, right? And so those are significant differences. But in terms of the ecosystems and, and the role they play, it's actually the same. So I had a picture, I don't know if, in my, in my last slide that is from, from the Himalayas, but looking down. And as you look at the Ganges Plain, do you see this haze everywhere, right? And, uh, and, uh, and, and that actually plays a very important role also in, um, so pollution from, from, you know, from Delhi, when, when we have some of the big, uh, uh, pollution events that actually goes up the mountains and some of that of those aerosols are trapped in the inner mountain region between the, the, the ridges and valleys and that completely changes the diurnal cycle of rainfall in, in those locations. So um, yeah, I could, I could have shown that, but which, which is really fascinating. So you see how 
the transport, of course, is controlled by large scale atmospheric um, uh, circulation, but then what happens locally is really controlled by the mountains. Well, I'm going to thank you all very much. We are running out of time. Thank you all for attending the fascinating talk thank and you. also those of you online. Yes, Thanks please. very much.